Welcome back. Let's once again recall what I've said in the last two segments of this series, that qualitative research is like a light in the darkness that helps us make sense of the shapes and shadows we see in the distance. One of the most important roles a researcher plays in conducting a study is providing good design. When a study is poorly designed, it might as well not be conducted. It produces junky data, and it's going to produce junky reactions as a result. Believe it or not, qualitative research is much like quantitative research in how it's designed. And the steps are exactly the same, but because qualitative research has some different considerations, we do want to modify those steps just a little bit. Now, this is the framework that uh, for planning marketing research that comes from a textbook that I used when I was teaching undergraduate research here at SIUE, Burns and Bush, Bush's uh, Marketing Research, 7th edition. And I like this framework. It breaks everything down into 11 steps, but I have further divided it into three phases. Phase one is conception, phase two is design and gather, and phase three is analyze and report. I find it a little bit easier to think about these three phases because that's kind of how research projects tend to break down. And I'm going to review these steps now because they are important, but I'm going to put a qualitative research twist on them to help you make, help, help make you understand how they are a little bit different as well. So beginning in our conception phase, the first step is to establish the need for marketing research. And this phase is important because it involves determining whether or not marketing research is actually needed or whether information already exists to resolve the question that we have. What I tend to tell my clients during this phase is that there's a big difference between what's nice to know and what we need to know. If an informational need isn't great enough to fall into the need to know category, it's likely not a good idea to conduct marketing research on it. Sometimes what we need to do is gather secondary data and secondary data is data that are uh, that come from another purpose and we're going to try to apply to our research purpose. Sources of secondary data can be internal or external. Organizations that are highly siloed, which means that they have divisions that don't share information or resources very well, often have information that they're not using to support decision making elsewhere. And it's worth encouraging large organizations to explore what they have internally before they start looking for external answers. This can help them to refine their research needs. And I often encourage clients to consider conducting what I call FNF research or friends and family, which is an informal method of simply getting some outside opinions from sympathetic sources. For example, I have one client that says he consults with his wife for reactions to his marketing campaign campaigns and that she's a great source of insight to him. That's a great example of FNF research. And while it's not scientific in any way, is still a valuable source of information for gauging basic human reactions outside an organization's structure. Secondary data can also come from published sources, and there are many research organizations that sell data for that purpose. Aside from a la carte case study style reports, there are also sources of syndicated data and omnibus studies that are fairly inexpensive to access compared to conducting full-blown primary research. Academic studies are also worth looking into for approaches and contexts. You might also be tempted to look on your friend Google, and the sort of information you can find on the web for free is available, but it's generally a poor substitute for anything that you can buy or that you have to find through a journal. But it's always worth looking. Sometimes you find a good public policy paper or a good white paper or maybe a good talk that references data that can be really helpful to you. The next step is defining the problem. And as you should know by now, this is the most important step of your entire marketing research process. A good problem statement succinctly defines the boundaries of a research project and what it should include. But for qualitative research, the research problem isn't always as clear as it is in quantitative research, particularly if you're conducting some exploration or a deep dive. So it's important to consider your problem statement not just in terms of the decisions that you're trying to support, but the informational deficiencies that you're hoping to address. Unlike quantitative research, you may not always have a decision statement to articulate. Think about this. The purpose of this research is to develop a stronger understanding of consumers who express low satisfaction and to determine what steps can be taken to improve their overall customer experience. That's a perfectly qualitative problem definition. It doesn't point to direct action, but it does articulate a direction for the data. And that word direction is a good way to think about qualitative research. We often say that qualitative research yields directional, not statistical insights. It's a guide to help you to know where you can go next in more general terms. It's not a set of GPS coordinates that can be used to plot your next course. The third step, establishing the research objectives, is equally important. Some researchers like myself first start with research objective statements and then define questions. Many researchers do things the opposite way. In fact, that's why we train students in the MMR program to write out the big questions and then establish smaller objectives. 
Whatever system makes sense to you, use it. There's no right or wrong way to design research objectives, and different organizations use different approaches. But at the end of the day, your objectives should guide you and help you clearly define what information you need to collect. Now we're going to move on to phase two, which is design and gather. And I'll simplify our discussion here because you likely know the big picture details from other classes that you've taken on marketing research. When you're determining the research design, you need to think carefully about the application because that will determine which method you use and how you're going to ask questions. During the next several lecture series, we'll be talking about the design of different methods in more detail. But what I will take a moment to discuss here is the sample plan and size, because chances are good when you've discussed this detail in other classes, it's been in the context of quantitative research. For qualitative research, it's going to be rare that you're going to use a probability-based sampling method and far more likely that you're going to use a purposive or referral or quota-based sampling, which are non-probability techniques that attempt to approximate randomness. So they're not really random, but they approximate it. Why don't we use a random sample? Simply put, because these sample sizes are too small to go to the trouble of finding a sample frame to serve as our master list and then to attempt to recruit a probability-based sample who can participate in a detailed qualitative process. The marginal benefit that you're going to receive from having a probability-based sample at such a small size is mitigated by the fact that you're not really drawing statistics and you don't need to make inferences based on the assumptions of having a normal distribution. Because often, even if you did make those inferences, the margin of error would be so high, you wouldn't be able to detect with any validity or reliability any extreme differences. Instead, qualitative researchers tend to use purposive sampling, which relies on the judgment of the researcher to approximate what a randomly selected population might look like. Or we might use quota sampling, which sets quotas defined either by arbitrary criteria, like 30% men and 70% women, or we could say parameters defined from other research. And both of these methods work just fine. In hard to reach populations or new contexts, referral sampling can be quite useful, particularly in an exploration application where you might not know who to talk to next and you need your initial research participants to put you on the right track. And then there are times where it's just easy to use a flat out conven convenient sample from a generally defined population or from a research panel because you're more concerned about getting warm bodies into a focus group or scheduled into interviews than anything else. And very commonly, if you're just looking for quick reactions, those warm bodies are all you really need. Now, my own firm uses a technique that we're going to call a maximum mix, is what we call it at my firm. We look at the boundaries of our criteria, and we try to make sure we hit as many of them as possible. For example, if we've got to recruit 20 to 25 people for a population defined as being between 25 to 65 years old and a 50-50 split of men and women, we're going to try to ensure we have at least one man and one woman who fits each of those age extremes within a few years, and then we might have a good mixture of 30, 40, and 50-somethings from both genders in between. That makes life a lot easier for our recruiters, and it ensures that we have a fairly decent sample that represents the breadth of our population. But it's very important to consider your population definition and qualitative research as being more of a general guideline rather than an ironclad rule, particularly if you're hoping to get voices from groups that are in a minority or which aren't likely to be proportionally included if you stick with straight population parameters. For example, if I were doing community focus groups in an area like uh, St. Charles County on the west side of St. Louis that's predominantly Caucasian, I'll instruct my recruiter to also strive to include a few folks from other ethnic groups as well as our participant pool, just so we don't miss out on their perspective. The same is true for income, levels of education, household size, and other criteria that might be important to me depending on the study. That's extremely valuable to me and my observers, but it's also extremely purposive on my part. But at the same time, I can't be too specific about who we recruit for the study or it becomes a needle in a haystack situation. I might be able to give my recruiter 25 profiles that are all unique and distinct, but unless I'm prepared to give him or her a year and then pay a lot of money for that sample, it's going to be difficult to achieve. If I really need that level of control over my participants, it's better to work with a panel provider who can match my criteria to a large pool of potential participants using already captured data and then narrow the recruiting down to those individuals. Even then, a lot of times panel providers are not able to provide that level of participant. The trade-off with panels for qualitative research is that participants have opted into the research process, participate in several studies a month, and tend to be what I'd call 
professional respondents where they almost perform for the process and don't always behave like real research participants. I also grow concerned sometimes that panel participants aren't entirely truthful because they don't want to be disqualified from future studies. Sometimes we may hear them slip up and admit to something that means that they thwarted our screening criteria, particularly if we ask them something like if they work in an industry like advertising or marketing, and they've gotten around it by not telling us that they're, they do, but they're freelance writers or designers who produce work for local ad firms. So they don't actually work for the firms, but they do some freelance work for them. It's happened. The field for qualitative research generally doesn't, re, or field work for qualitative research generally doesn't require very much time because the work is scheduled for discrete days or weeks and then it's over quickly. Scheduled in-person interviews and focus groups can be conducted in a matter of days. Telephone interviews often in a week or two. Observational research and ethnographies can be trickier depending upon the depth of data required, but generally speaking, qualitative research doesn't have to take as long as quantitative surveying process does, unless you're using a panel, in which case quant beats qual every time. With that said, as we move on to phase three, analysis and reporting, the analytic time required for qualitative work can be significant. A simple qualitative study can require weeks to report back if you're producing a full report with appendix, and a complex qualitative study can require months of analytic time. To make matters worse, most of the computer software out there that's available to cut down on the time involved isn't very effective, and it requires a lot of data over time to train properly. Using software for custom studies is often out of the question. A human being has to do the analysis, and as we'll discuss in later weeks, the categorization and or coding of qualitative data is a lengthy process fraught with opportunities to goof things up. So that's one reason that reporting for qualitative research can vary so much in its look and feel. Do clients who observe a qualitative process really need a full report, or is a top line report with the big picture items sufficient? Is it better to put out top line reports piecemeal by market or subgroup, or is it better to publish a report together in a single document that includes more thoughtful analysis and comparative data? Are transcripts really needed when we record everything on audio and video anyhow? Or do clients just want juicy quotes? Do they want juicy summaries? Do they want synthesis? All of the above greatly depend upon the client and the project. There are certainly preferred practices out there and conventions many qualitative researchers adhere to, but I'd be greatly misleading you if I claim there was an accepted best practice for reporting qualitative data. There is not. And the best thing you can do as a qualitative researcher is collaborate with other qualitative researchers to share approaches and ideas for how to best present data. I'd also like to note that the quantitative side of research has greatly shifted from to what we call PowerPoint style, bridging research reports with presentations and essentially producing the key findings as a research presentation deck in the appendix as a bunch of slides that come afterwards. I'm going to be honest with you. This format stinks for qualitative research, and I'm actually not fond of it for quant either. Qualitative reports are often accompanied by appendices that could be hundreds of pages long. They don't work in a slide format, and they're really better built in a desktop publishing program like Microsoft Word, which is used pretty commonly, or something more sophisticated like Adobe InDesign, if you have the skill to use it. There's also an emerging trend of producing key findings as slides. Sizzle reels, glossy magazine style reports, or infographics, and then putting appendices online using tools that allow for drill downs and segmentation. This style is much more efficient and time effective, but it also tends to provide a shallower approach to data analysis and reporting. This is, I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, the preferred approach of many advertising agencies, but I would suggest this is better suited to their objectives than to a marketing researcher's. Ad agencies want to promote the idea that their advertising works and what they know or, and that they know what's best. Advertise, or researchers are really supposed to be more objective and focused on helping clients understand the totality of their data, including the nuance. It's quite acceptable to have an agency you're partnered with help you refine your message and deliverables if they're willing to do so, but just be aware that their agenda may uh, create a desire for flash and excitement, and don't let that overshadow the message of your body of research. With all that said, we've been through a lot, and I hope this overview of the marketing research process from a qualitative point of view has been useful for you. Our next two segments are going to shift gears slightly to the role of the observer in qualitative research, but keep in mind that I'm going to assume from here on out that these fundamentals we've discussed so far are still very present in your mind.